Hi friends and welcome back to Book Club with Ms. Dub. I'm Ms. Dub and today we are going to be reading chapter 11 in To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. If you have the text, go ahead and grab it and join me as I read. And if you don't, that's totally fine. You can either follow along in closed captioning or you can just listen in as um, I read and let your mind and imagination enjoy the story. Let's go ahead and get started on chapter 11. When we were small, Jim and I confined our activities to the southern neighborhood. But when I was well into the second grade at school and tormenting Boo Radley, Bradley became passe, the business section of Maycomb drew us frequently up the street past the real property of Ms. Henry Lafayette DeBose. It was impossible to go to town without passing her house unless we wished to walk a mile out of the way. Previous minor encounters with her left me with no desire for more but Jim and I had to grow up sometime. Ms. DeBose lived alone, except for a Negro girl in constant attendance, two doors up the street from us in a house with steep front steps and a dog trot hall. She was very old. She spent most of each day in bed and the rest of it in a wheelchair. It was rumored that she kept a CSA pistol concealed among her numerous shawls and wraps. Jim and I hated her. If she was on the porch when we passed, we would be raped by her wrathful gaze, subjected to ruthless interrogation regarding our behavior and given a melancholy prediction on what we would amount to when we grew up, which was always nothing. We had long ago given up the idea of walking past her house on the opposite side of the street. That, that only made her raise her voice and let the whole neighborhood in on it. We could do nothing to please her. If I said as sunnily as I could, hey, Ms. DeBose, I would receive for an answer. Don't you say hey to me, you ugly girl. You say good afternoon, Mrs. DeBose. She was vicious. Once she heard Jim refer to our father as Atticus and her reaction was apopletic. Besides being the sassiest, most disrespectful mutts who ever passed her way, we were told that it was quite a pity our father had not remarried after our mother's death. A lovelier lady than our mother never lived, she said, and it was heartbreaking the way Atticus Finch let her children run wild. I did not remember our mother, but Jim did. He would tell me about her sometimes, and he went livid when Ms. DeBose shot us this message. Jim, having survived Boo Radley, a mad dog, and other terrors, had concluded that it was cowardly to stop at Miss Rachel's front steps and wait. and had decreed that we must run as far as the post office corner each evening to meet Atticus coming from work. Countless evenings, Atticus would find Jim furious at something Ms. DeBose had said when we went by. Easy does it, son, Atticus would say. She's an old lady and she's ill. You just hold your head high and be a gentleman. Whatever she says to you, it's your job not to let her make you mad. Jim would say she must not be very sick, she hollered so. When the three of us came to her house, Atticus would sweep off his hat, wave gallantly to her and say, good evening, Mrs. DeBose. You look like a picture this evening. I never heard Atticus say what a picture, like a picture of what. He would tell her the courthouse news and would say he hoped with all his heart she'd have a good day tomorrow. He would return his hat to his head, swing me to his shoulders in her very presence and we would go home in the twilight. It was times like these when I thought my father, who hated guns, and had never been to any wars, was the bravest man who ever lived. The day after Jim's 12th birthday, his money was burning up his pockets, so we headed for town in the early afternoon. Jim thought he had enough money to buy a miniature steam engine for himself and a twirling baton for me. I had long had my eye on that baton. It was at V.J. Elmore's. It was bedecked with sequins and tinsel. It cost 17 cents. It was then my burning ambition to grow up and twirl with the Maycomb County High School Band. Having developed my talent to where I could throw up a stick and almost catch it coming down, I had caused Calpurnia to deny me interest to the, entrance to the house every time she saw me with a stick in my hand. I felt that I could overcome this defect with a real baton, and I thought it generous of Jim to buy one for me. Mrs. DeBose was stationed on her porch when we went by. Where are you two going at this time of day, she shouted. Playing hooky, I suppose. I'll just call up the principal and tell him. She put her hands on the wheels of her chair and executed a perfect right face. 
Oh, it's Saturday, Mrs. DeBose, said Jim. Makes no difference if it's Saturday, she said obscurely. I wonder if your father knows where you, where you are. Mrs. DeBose, we've been going to town by ourselves since we were this high. Jim placed his hand palm about two feet above the sidewalk. Don't you lie to me, she yelled. Jeremy Finch, Maudie Atkinson told me you broke down her Skeppernong Arbor this morning. She's going to tell your father and then you'll wish you never saw the light of day. If you aren't sent to the reform school before next week's, my name's not DePose. Jim, who hadn't been near Miss Maudie's Skeppernong Arbor since last summer and who knew Miss Maudie wouldn't tell Atticus if she had, issued a general denial. Don't you contradict me, Mrs. DeBose bawled. And you, she pointed an arthritic finger at me. What are you doing in those overalls? You should be in a dress and camisole, young lady. You'll grow up waiting on tables if somebody doesn't change your ways. A finch waiting on tables at the OK Cafe. Ha! I was terrified. The OK Cafe was a dim organization on the north side of the square. I grabbed Jim's hand, but he shook me loose. Come on, Scout, he whispered. Don't pay any attention to her. Just hold your head high and be a gentleman. But Mrs. DeBose held us. Not only a finch waiting on tables, but one in the courthouse lying for inwards. Jim stiffened. Mrs. DeBose's shot had gone home and she knew it. Yes, indeed. What has this world come to when a finch goes against his raising? I'll tell you. She put her hand to her mouth. When it drew away, it trailed a long silver thread of saliva. Your father's no better than the inwards and trash he works for. Jim was scarlet. I pulled at his sleeve and we were followed up the sidewalk by a Philippic on our family's moral degeneration. The major premise of which was that half the finches were in the asylum anyway. But if our mother were living, we would not have come to such a state. I wasn't sure what Jim resented most, but I took umbrage at Mrs. DeBose's assessment of the family's mental hygiene. I had become almost accustomed to hearing insults aimed at Atticus. <laughs> Sorry. But this was the first one coming from an adult. Except for her remarks about Atticus, Mrs. DeBose's attack was only routine. There was a hint of summer in the air. In the shadows, it was cool, but the sun was warm, which meant good times coming. No school and dill. Jim bought his steam engine and we went by Elmore's for my baton. Jim took no pleasure in his acquisition. He jammed it in his pocket and walked silently beside me toward home. On the way home, I nearly hit Miss Link Dees, who said, look out now, Scout, when I missed a toss. And when we approached Miss DeBose's house, my baton was grimy from having picked it up out of the dirt so many times. She was not on the porch. Sorry. She was not on the porch. In later years, I sometimes wondered exactly what made Jim do it and what made him break the bonds of you just be a gentleman, son. And the phase of self-conscious rectitude you had, he had recently entered. Jim had probably stood as much guff about Atticus lying for inwards as had I and I took it for granted that he kept his temper. He had a naturally tranquil disposition and a slow fuse. At the time, however, I thought the only explanation for what he did was that for a few minutes, he simply went mad. What Jim did was something I'd do as a matter of course, had I not been under Atticus's interdict, which I assumed included not fighting horrible old ladies. We had just come to her gate when Jim snatched my baton and ran flailing wildly up the steps into Mrs. DeBose's front yard, forgetting everything Atticus had said, forgetting that she packed a pistol under her shawls, forgetting that if Ms. DeBose missed, her girl Jessie probably wouldn't. He did not begin to calm down until he had cut the tops off every camellia bush Ms. DeBose owned until the ground was littered with green buds and leaves. He bent my baton against his knee, snapped it in two, and threw it down. By that time, I was shrieking. Jim yanked my hair, said he didn't care. He'd do it again if he got the chance. And I didn't shut up. And if I didn't shut up, he'd pull every hair out of my head. I didn't shut up, and he kicked me. I lost my balance and fell on my face. Jim picked me up roughly, but looked like he was sorry. 
There was nothing to say. We did not choose to meet Atticus coming home that evening. We skulked around the kitchen until Calpurnia threw us out. By some voodoo system, Calpurnia seemed to know all about it. She was a less than satisfactory source of palliation, but she did give Jim a hot biscuit and butter, which he tore in half and shared with me. It tasted like cotton. We went to the living room. I picked up a football magazine, found a picture of Dixie Howell, showed it to Jim and said, this looks like you. That was the nicest thing I could think to say to him, but it was no help. He sat by the windows, hunched down in a rocking chair, scowling, waiting. Daylight faded. Two geological ages later, we heard the soles of Atticus's shoes scrape the front steps. The screen door slammed. There was a pause. Atticus was at the hat rack in the hall, and we heard him call, Jim? His voice was like the winter wind. Atticus switched on the ceiling light in the living room and found us there, frozen still. He carried my baton in one hand. Its filthy yellow tassel trailed on the rug. He held out his other hand. It contained fat camellia buds. Jim, he said, are you responsible for this? Yes, sir. Why'd you do it? Jim said softly. She said you logged for N-words and trash. You did this because she said that? Jim's lips moved, but his yes, sir was inaudible. Son, I have no doubt that you've been annoyed by your contemporaries about me longing for inwards, as you say. But to do something like this to a sick old lady is inexcusable. I strongly advise you to go down and have a talk with Mrs. DeBose, said Atticus. Come straight home afterward. Jim did not move. Go on, I said. I followed Jim out of the living room. Come back here, Atticus said to me. I came back. Atticus picked up the mobile press and sat down in the rocking chair Jim had vacated. For the life of me, I did not understand how he could sit there in cold blood and read a newspaper when his only son stood an excellent chance of being murdered with a Confederate army relic. Of course, Jim antagonized me sometimes until I could kill him. But when it came down to it, he was all I had. Atticus did not seem to realize this, or if he did, he didn't care. I hated him for that. But when you're in trouble, you become easily tired. Soon I was hiding in his lap and his arms were around me. You're mighty big to be rocked, he said. You don't care what happens to him, I said. You just send him on to get shot at when all he was doing was standing up for you. Atticus pushed my head under his chin. It's not time to worry yet, he said. I never thought Jim would be the one to lose his head over this. I thought I'd have more trouble with you. I said I didn't see why we had to keep our heads anyways, that nobody I knew at school had to keep his head about anything. Scout, said Atticus, when summer comes, you'll have to keep your head about far, far worse things. It's not fair for you and Jim, I know that, but sometimes we have to make the best of things. And the way we conduct ourselves when our chips are down, well, all I can say is, when you and Jim are grown, maybe you'll look back on this with some compassion and some feeling that I didn't let you down. This case, Tom Robinson's case, is something that goes down, that goes to the essence of man's conscience. Scout, I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't try to help that man. Atticus, you must be wrong. How's that? Well, most folks seem to think they're right and you're wrong. They're certainly entitled to think that, and they're entitled to full respect for their opinions, said Atticus. But before I can live with other folks, I've got to live with myself. The one thing that doesn't abide by majority rule is a person's conscience. When Jim returned, he found me still in Atticus's lap. Well, son, said Atticus. He set me on my feet, and I made a secret reconnaissance of Jim. He seemed to be all in one piece, but he had a queer look on his face. Perhaps she had given him a dose of calomel. I cleaned it up for her and said I was sorry, but I ain't, and that I'd work on him every Saturday and try to make him grow back out. There was no point in saying you were sorry if you aren't, said Atticus. Jim, she's old and ill. You can't hold her responsible for what she says and does. Of course, I'd rather she'd have said it to me than to either of you, but we can't always have our druthers. Jim seemed fascinated by a rose in the carpet. Atticus, he said, she wants me to read to her.
read to her? Yes, sir. She wants me to come over every afternoon after school and Saturdays to read to her out loud for two hours. Atticus, do I have to? Certainly. If she wants me to do it for a month, then you'll do it for a month. Jim planted his big toe delicately in the center of the rose and pressed it in. Finally, he said, Atticus, it's all right on the sidewalk, but inside it's, it's all dark and creepy. There's shadows and things on the ceiling. Atticus smiled grimly. That should appeal to your imagination. Just pretend you're in the Radley house. The following Monday afternoon, Jim and I climbed the steep front steps to Mrs. DeBose's house and padded down the open hallway. Jim, armed with Ivanhoe and, a full, and full of superior knowledge, knocked at the second door of the, on the left. Mrs. DeBose, he called. Jessie opened the wood door and unlatched the screen door. Is that you, Jim Finch, she said. You got your sister with you? I don't know. Let them both in, Jessie, said Mrs. DeBose. Jessie admitted us and went off into the kitchen. An oppressive odor met us when we crossed the threshold. An odor I had met many times in rain-rotted gray houses where there were coal oil lamps, water dippers, and unbleached domestic sheets. It always made me afraid, expectant, watchful. In the corner of the room was a brass bed, and in the bed was Mrs. Defoe's. I wondered if Jim's activities were put had put her there, and for a moment I felt sorry for her. She was lying under a pile of quilts and looked almost friendly. There was a marble-topped washstand by her bed. On it were a glass with a teaspoon in it, a red ear syringe, a box of absorbent cotton, and a steel alarm clock standing on three tiny legs. So you brought that dirty little sister of yours, did you? was her greeting. Jim said quietly, my sister ain't dirty and I ain't scared of you although I noticed his knees shaking. I was expecting a tirade, but all she said was, you may commence reading, Jeremy. Jim sat down in a cane bottom chair and opened Ivanhoe. I pulled up another one and sat beside him. Come closer, said Mrs. Bose. Come to the side of the bed. We moved our chairs forward. This was the nearest I had ever been to her. And the thing I wanted most to do was move my chair back again. She was horrible. Her face was the color of a dirty pillowcase and the corners of her mouth glistened with wet, which inched like a glacier down the deep grooves enclose, enclosing her chin. Old age liver spots dotted her cheeks and her pale eyes had black pinpoint pupils. Her hands were knobby and the cuticles were grown up over her fingernails. Her bottom plate was not in and her upper lip plate and her upper lip protruded from time to time she would draw her nether lip to her upper plate and carry her chin with it. This made the wet move faster. I didn't look any more than I had to. Jim reopened Ivanhoe and began reading. I tried to keep up with him, but he read too fast. When Jim came to a word he didn't know, he skipped it, but Mrs. DeBose would catch him and make him spell it out. Jim read for perhaps 20 minutes, during which time I looked at the soot-stained mantelpiece out the window, anywhere to keep from looking at her. As he read along, I noticed that Mrs. DeBose's corrections grew fewer and farther between, that Jim had even left one sentence dangling in midair. She was not listening. I looked toward the bed. Something had happened to her. She lay on her back with the quilts up to her chin. Only her head and shoulders were visible. Her head moved slowly from side to side. From time to time, she would open her mouth wide and I could see her tongue undulate faintly. Hordes of saliva would collect on her lips she would draw them in, then open her mouth again. Her mouth seemed to have a private existence of its own. It worked separate and apart from the rest of her, out and in like a clam hole at low tide. Occasionally it would say, like some vicious substance coming to a boil. I pulled Jim's sleeve. He looked at me and then at the bed. Her head made its regular sweep toward us. And Jim said, Mrs. DeBose, are you all right? She didn't hear him. The alarm clock went off <clears throat> and scared us stiff. A minute later, nerves still tingling, Jim and I were on the sidewalk headed for home. We did not run away, Jessie sent us. Before the clock wound down, she was in the room pushing Jim and me out of it. Shoo, she said, you all go home. Jim hesitated at the door. It's time for her medicine, Jessie said. 
As the door swung shut behind us, I saw Jesse walking quickly toward Mrs. DeBose's bed. It was only 3.45 when we got home, so Jim and I dropped kicked in the backyard until it was time to meet Atticus. Atticus had two yellow pencils for me and a football magazine for Jim, which I suppose was a silent reward for our first day's session with Ms. DeBose. Jim told him what happened. Did she frighten you? asked Atticus. No, sir, said Jim, but she's so nasty. She has fits or something. She spits a lot. She can't help that. When people are sick, they don't look nice sometimes. She scared me, I said. Atticus looked at me over his glasses. You don't have to go with Jim, you know. The next afternoon at Mrs. DeBose's was the same as the first, and so was the next, until gradually a pattern emerged. Everything would begin normally. That is, Mrs. DeBose would hound Jim for a while on her favorite subjects, her camellias and our father's inward loving propensities. She would grow increasingly silent and then go away from us. The alarm clock would ring, Jesse would shoo us out, and the rest of the day was ours. Atticus, I said one evening, what exactly is a inward lover? Atticus' face was grave. Has somebody been calling you that? No, sir. M Mrs. DeBose calls you that. She w warms up every afternoon calling you that. Francis called me that last Christmas. That's where I first heard it. Is that the reason you jumped on him? Asked Atticus. Yes, sir. Then why are you asking me what it means? I tried to explain to Atticus that it wasn't so much what Francis said that had infuriated me as the way he said it. It was like he'd said snot nose or something. Scout, said Atticus, inward lover is just one of those terms that don't mean anything like snot nose. It's hard to explain. Ignorant, trashy people use it when they think somebody's favoring Negroes over and above themselves. It slipped into usage with some people like ourselves when they want a common ugly term to label somebody. You aren't really an inward lover then, are you? I certainly am. I do my best to love everybody. I'm hard put sometimes. Baby, it's never an insult to be called what somebody thinks is a bad name. It just shows you how poor that person is. It doesn't hurt you. So don't let Mrs. DeBose get you down. She has enough troubles of her own. One afternoon, a month later, Jim was plowing his way through Sir Walter Scout, as Jim called him, and Mrs. DeBose was correcting him at every turn when there was a knock on the door. Come in, she screamed. Atticus came in. He went to the bed and took Mrs. DeBose's hand. I was coming from the office and didn't see the children, he said. I thought they might still be here. Mrs. DeBose smiled at him. For the life of me, I could not figure out how she could bring herself to speak to him when she seemed to hate him so. Do you know what time it is, Atticus, she said. Exactly 14 minutes past five. The alarm clock set for 5.30. I want you to know that. It suddenly came to me that each day we had been staying a little longer at Mrs. DeBose's DeBose's that the alarm clock went off a few minutes later every day and that she was well into one of her fits by the time it sounded. Today she had antagonized Jim for nearly two hours with no intention of having a fit and I felt hopelessly trapped. The alarm clock was the signal for our release. If one day it did not ring, what would we do? I have a feeling that Jim's reading days are numbered, said Atticus. Only a week longer, I think, she said, just to make sure. Jim rose, but Atticus put his hand out and Jim was silent. On the way home, Jim said he had to do it for just a month and the month was up and it wasn't fair. Just one more week, said Atticus. No, said Jim. Yes, said Atticus. The following week found us back at Mrs. DeBose's. The alarm clock had ceased sounding, but Mrs. DeBose would release us with, that'll do. So late in the afternoon, Atticus would be home reading the paper when we returned. Although her fits had passed, she was in every other way her old self. When Sir Walter Scott became involved in lengthy descriptions of moats and castles, Mrs. DeBose would become bored and pick on us. Jeremy Finch, I told you you'd live to regret tearing up my camellias. You regret it now, don't you? Jim would say he certainly did. Thought you could kill my snow on the mountain, did you? Well, Jesse says the top's growing back out. 
Next time you'll know how to do it right, won't you? You'll pull it up by the roots, won't you? Jim said he certainly would. Don't you mutter at me, boy. You hold your head. Hold up your head and say, yes, ma'am. Don't guess you feel like holding it up, though, with your father what he is. Jim's chin would come down and he would gaze at Mrs. DeBose's with a face devoid of resentment. Though the, through the weeks, he had cultivated an expression of polite and detached interest, which he would present to her in answer to her most blood-curdling inventions. At last, the day came when Mrs. DeBose said, that'll do, one afternoon she added, and that's all, good day to you. It was over. We bounded down the sidewalk on a spree of sheer relief, leaping and howling. That spring was a good one. The days grew longer and gave us more playing time. Jim's mind was occupied mostly on the vital statistics of every college football player in the nation. Every night, Atticus would read us the sports page of the newspaper. Alabama might be going to the Rose Bowl again this year, judging from its prospects, not one of whose names we could pronounce. Atticus was in the middle of Wendy Seaton's column one evening when the telephone rang. He answered it and went to the hat rack in the hall. I'm going down to Mrs. DeBose's for a while, he said. I won't be long. But Atticus stayed away until long past my bedtime. When he returned, he was carrying a candy box. Atticus sat down in the living room and put the box on the floor beside his chair. What you want? asked Jim. We had not seen Mrs. DeBose for over a month. She was never on the porch anymore when we passed. She's dead, son, said Atticus. She died a few minutes ago. Oh, said Jim. Well, well is right, said Atticus. She's not suffering anymore. She was sick for a long time. Son, didn't you know what her fits were? Jim shook his head. Mrs. DeBose was a morphine addict, said Atticus. She took it as a painkiller for years. The doctor put her on it. She'd have spent the rest of her life on it and died without much, so much agony but she was too contrary. Sir, said Jim. Atticus said, just before your escapade, she called me to make her will. Dr. Reynolds told her she only had a few months left. Her business affairs were in order, perfect order, but she said, there's still one thing out of order. What was that? Jim was perplexed. She said she was going to leave this world beholden to nothing and nobody. Jim, when you're as sick as she was, it's all right to take anything to make it easier, but it wasn't all right for her. She said she meant to break herself of it before she died, and that's what she did. Jim said, you mean that's what her fits were? Yes, that's what they were. Most of the time you were reading to her, I doubt if she heard a word you said. Her whole mind and body were concentrated on that alarm clock. If you hadn't fallen into her hands, I'd have made you go read to her anyway. It may have been some distraction. There was another reason. Did she die free? asked Jim. As the mountain air, said Atticus. She was conscious to the last, almost. Conscious, he smiled, and cantankerous. She still disapproved heartily of my doings and said I'd probably spend the rest of my life bailing you out of jail. She had Jessie fix you this box. Atticus reached down and picked up the candy box. He handed it to Jim. Jim opened the box. Inside, surrounded by wads of damp cotton, was a white, waxy, perfect camellia. It was a snow on the mountain. <clears throat> Jim's eyes nearly popped out of his head. Old hell devil, old hell devil, she, he screamed, flinging it down. Why can't she leave me alone? In a flash, Atticus was up and standing over him. Jim buried his face in Atticus's shirt front. Shh, he said. I think that was her way of telling you Everything's all right now, Jim. Everything's all right. You know, she was a great lady. A lady? Jim raised his head. His face was scarlet. After all those things she said about you, a lady? She was. She had her own views about things, a lot different from mine, maybe. Son, I told you that if you hadn't lost your head, I'd have made you go read to her. I wanted you to see something about her. I wanted you to see what real courage is instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win, but sometimes you do. Mrs. DeBose won all 98 pounds of her. According to her views, she died beholden to nothing and nobody. She was the bravest person I ever knew.
Jim picked up the candy box and threw it in the fire. He picked up the camellia. And when I went off to bed, I saw him fingering the wide petals. Atticus was reading the paper. And that's the end of part one of To Kill a Mockingbird. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you're enjoying the book. And it would mean the world to me if you would go ahead and use the next few seconds to go ahead and hit that like button if you're enjoying this content. And if you would um, do so, it will help our read aloud um, content to reach more people and it'll help us grow our read aloud community. Um, if you're not subscribed, will you go ahead and please subscribe? Um, it would really make a big difference to our channel and mean a lot to me personally. Thank you so much for joining me and I can't wait to read again with you soon. Bye.